morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Corey, for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. And it's my pleasure to talk to you about targeted treatment with EGFR TKIs. And for the focus of this talk, I'm really going to limit my discussion to first line uh, treatment options for this disease. <clears throat> so as Dr. Ross elegantly pointed out, targeted therapy in today's day and age has been consistently shown to improve survival. Uh, we have been able to dissect different subtypes of non-small cell lung cancer, and we are beginning to really appreciate the biology that drives um, uh, that drives survival, that drives prognosis, and we can actually predict how these patients will do. We know that targeted therapy consistently improves survival. And now we have several drugs. Um, these are drugs that have either appeared promising in clinical trials or that are currently available, uh, FDA approved for the treatment of these subsets. So you'll see we have five drugs available for EGFR mutant lung cancer. And you'll see a smaller subset like RET now has uh, new active and promising agents that we can offer to our patients. So EGFR mutation testing, as Dr. Ross pointed out, is currently standard in the upfront setting. Um, it's a routine practice to do this every time we get a diagnosis of non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. And we now have five FDA-approved oral TKIs uh, with dacomitinib joining the, um, the group recently. And there have been several randomized studies that have established oral targeted therapies as superior therapy compared with chemotherapy. This is just a broad list of all the studies that have been done spanning the last decade, which have really cemented the role of oral TKIs. But is there a perfect targeted therapy? And what do we want? And when I say we, what do patients want? What do physicians want? What do caregivers want? Uh, we want survival, we want reduced CNS metastases, and we want tolerability. I'm sorry that's not uh, projecting well. Um, maybe not necessarily in that order, but we also want to use our best drugs first. So with that... Um, and also, we have to remember that many patients may never make it to second-line therapy. So with those caveats, I wanted to give you a brief outline of my talk. I'm going to discuss flora, uh, which looks at osimertinib versus gefitinib, and then I'm going to dive into other data for first-line uh, treatment options. So Osimartinib is a third generation oral TKI and it has been extensively studied. The, these are results from the phase one aura study that looked at uh, treatment naive uh, patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer and in their dose expansion cohort, there was a 77% overall response rate that was seen uh, with both the 80 milligram and 160 milligram daily dose of osimertinib. And there was actually no evidence of acquired EGFR T7 90M um, observed in the post-progression samples. Based on these really fascinating data in the phase one pre-treatment or treatment-naive setting, a uh, FLORA trial was launched, which is basically a first-line trial of osimertinib versus erlotinib or gefitinib. Patients were treatment-naive uh, with exon 19 deletion or L858R, and were randomized to osimertinib or standard of care based on physician or provider preference. Primary free, uh, progression free survival was the primary endpoint. Um, the population was very well balanced in terms of sex, race, CNS metastases at baseline, as well as the proportion of uh, exon 19 versus exon 21 deletion. As you can see, the waterfall plots look very impressive. I will point out that the waterfall plots also look impressive for the standard of care arm with significant patients having responses, but the osimertinib um, waterfall plot looks perhaps slightly even more impressive. 
And these are the primary results. So on top is the progression-free survival. As you can see, uh, the primary endpoint was met for this trial with a hazard ratio of 0.46. Again, this is interesting because this is not compared to chemotherapy. This is compared to erlotinib or tofitinib that most of us were using at the time these data came out. And then at the bottom, you'll see overall survival in the in at the interim analysis um, significant improvement with a hazard ratio of 0.63. What was also interesting was that patients with CNS metastases derived the same degree of benefit in terms of progression-free survival on the left here compared to those patients that did not have CNS metastases. And unlike many other trials, patients on this trial were allowed to enter uh, even if they had CNS metastases. So again, goes to show you that this drug has quite a broad range of activity, including intracranial activity. Overall, well tolerated compared to erlotinib and gefitinib, um, the rates of significant or severe AEs did not appear that high. The main side effects were a uh, rash and uh, perhaps an increase in LFTs, which most of us are pretty used to dealing with now and know how to manage prophylactically as well. So moving on. Recently, we saw data on Archer. Uh, this is a phase three randomized trial comparing dacometinib uh, versus gefitinib. Again, in the treatment naive uh, setting, uh, results were presented at ASCO. And basically what we saw was there was an improvement in progression-free survival compared to gefitinib with a PFS of 14.7 months. And the final OS was just presented um, and published in JCO with an improvement in overall survival compared to gefitinib. There were 452 patients that were enrolled. I will point out that dacometinib had quite a significantly different toxicity profile compared to gefitinib. Uh, Two-thirds of the patients on the DACO arm required dose reduction compared to only 8% with gefitinib. And it is recently FDA approved for this uh, indication. However, I don't quite significantly expect it to change prescribing patterns. Um, you know, I'm not very sure how it fits currently, especially I'm not impressed with the intracranial activity and uh, the side effect profile may be cumbersome to manage. Moving on, um, would like to talk to you about role of anti-angiogenesis in EGFR mutant lung cancer. We know that anti-angiogenesis works. Uh, there have been many second-line trials looking at combination of lotinib and bevacizumab, um, which have shown improvement in PFS as outlined here. Again, these were very small studies and in the second line and mainly in the Asian population. This is a trial that was presented at ASCO this year. This is again looking at anti-angiogenesis. However, this time looking at it in the first line setting, patients were chemotherapy naive with exon 19 or 21 deletion, and they were randomized to either the BEV-EARL combination or just erlotinib monotherapy. And as you can see, the PFS was significantly improved at 16 months with a hazard ratio of 0.54. There was another study, uh, the NEJ026, again, um, a phase three study which looked at combination bev earl versus erlotinib monotherapy. And as you can see, this also met its primary endpoint of an improvement in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.6. I will point out that these studies are being compared to erlotinib monotherapy and may not be relevant uh, control arm in today's day and age. There's also this subset analysis from Empower 150, and as you'll see later on in today's talks, Empower 150 was a quadruplet combination uh, clinical trial looking at um, the addition of atezolizumab uh, with bevacizumab to a standard chemotherapy backbone, including carboplatin and paclitaxel. In subset analysis for patients that had EGFR or ALK mutations or translocations, uh, the 
overall survival seemed to be better with the addition of both atezolizumab and bevacizumab or the quadruplet arm with a hazard ratio of 0.54. I will point out that these are very small numbers, 41 patients, uh, and the method of detection of EGFR was not really specified. And should these patients get a non EGFR TKI regimen first is not very clear, and I'm not quite sure if this is um, enough for me to change practice just yet. But again, um, interesting data and definitely have generated a lot of interest in our community. Uh, based on these fascinating data with Bev and Earl, there's an ongoing trial looking at bevacizumab and osimertinib in EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, preliminary data suggests significant overall response rate and reasonable toxicity profile. What was Im interesting out of this presentation uh, was um, there was no CNS progression seen based on mandated interval MRI assessment. So stay tuned for this data. Moving on, looking at triplet therapy, this was a very interesting trial that was presented at um, ASCO this year, looking at sort of the kitchen sink approach of using everything up front that we have, thinking of, you know, many of these patients never make it to second line, so can we give them everything that we have up front? This uh, looked at patients that were previously untreated, um, locally advanced or metastatic with positive EGFR mutation, and they were randomized to gefitinib plus carboplatin plus pem pemetrexid or gefitinib alone, and they looked at two different uh, progression-free survivals, and then the overall survival was um, uh, was evaluated. Uh, patients could go on to the maintenance phase with gefitinib and pemetrexid or just a platinum-based uh, regimen. Here are the graphs. So progression-free survival um, is up here, which is progression-free survival one, which is basically the triplet, uh, when did patients progress post-triplet, and as you can see, it was significantly better for patients that first started with gefitinib alone. And then when you look at progression-free survival two, at the bottom, you'll see that the curve sort of looks similar. However, the real improvement is that we think that some of the patients that may have never made it to second line therapy were somehow salvaged by this approach. Um, as you can see at progression time point one, 88% were PS0 or one compared with 69% at PD2. There was a different toxicity profile. There was higher rate of chemotherapy related toxicities, uh, but there was somewhat of a benefit in terms of improved outcomes. I will point out that the overall survival for this combination was 52.2 months compared to only 38 months. Uh, and we are a little spoiled that we say only 38.8 months with Jafetnib. I mean, these are very good numbers, but the uh, improvement with the combination seems um, extremely significant. So how should we sequence new EGFR therapies? This seems to be the obvious approach. You know, we have osimertinib. We could use that upfront for all patients, which would give us a PFS of about 18.9 months. We could come back in with chemotherapy, uh, perhaps either with uh, an anti-angiogenesis approach, or we could even graft on immune therapy. However, with the approval of dacometinib, now we have another approach where we could come back in for our first line patients and treat them with dacometinib, we would expect a PFS of about 14.7 months. And then at progression, we still have the possibility of T790M emergent mutations, and then we could come in with osimertinib and expect another prolongation of progression-free survival, and then have chemotherapy. And for the patients that don't have T790M, um, do chemotherapy then. Also, interestingly, this is our other approach that we could take, is offer everyone gefitinib carbopem in the first-line setting, get a PFS of about 21 months, which was the PFS1 noted on the trial, and then we still have the option of using a T790M directed approach uh, versus using some other clinical trial or chemotherapy. So we do have several options, but I will uh, mention and circle back to our uh, initial question, what is, is there a perfect targeted therapy? And we know that we want survival, we need reduction in CNS metastases, and we want tolerability. Um, sorry. <clears throat> 
So I think at this point, it's safe to say that osimertinib meets OS, CNS activity, and superior tolerability. Um, and looking at everything, this probably should be our preferred first-line approach. Spending just two minutes quickly on role of immunotherapy. This is a hot topic in first-line treatment of EGFR mutant lung cancers. This was a clinical trial that um, was started. This was a phase two clinical trial of first-line pembrolizumab in EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer. Patients had to have pdl one expression greater than 1% and an EGFR mutation, and then they went on to receive pembrolizumab. Again, treatment naive, getting pembrolizumab in the first-line setting. And you will see that uh, the trial closed early after 11 patients, uh, but this was the treatment uh, demographic or tumor characteristic profile, there were eight patients with high pdl one expression, and we see this commonly, that patients with EGFR mute mutation often have high pdl one expression. But what was striking was that there was absolutely no responses seen in patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer treated with single agent immunotherapy. In fact, there was one patient that had a significant response rate who on repeat testing was found to have an EGFR wild type uh, subtype. I will also point out that there was one um, rate of fatal pneumonitis in this subgroup. So not only did we not help people, there was one person who actively died on the clinical trial. So maybe not a good idea. I will also point out uh, results from FLORA. This is the first line trial that we had discussed. At World Lung, they reviewed data from pdl one testing uh, from the samples that were available. Um, so they had uh, randomized, they had about 128 patients who were randomized to treatment um, for whom pdl one testing results were available. And these are the data. Um, you will see that even patients who received osimertinib, about 28% of those patients from the screened population did have high pdl one expression, more than 80%. And they looked at all of these three different uh, populations, so pdl one greater than 1%, pdl one negative in the middle with less than 1%, and then the unknown. And you can see across the board, irrespective of the level of pdl one expression, osimertinib seemed to benefit uh, compared to standard of care, even though the pdl one level was greater than 50%. And then resistance and beyond. We know that T790M is a resistance mutation that predominates the landscape after treatment with first and second generation TKIs, but there are several others that we know of, including MET amplification, HER2, BRAF, as well as small cell transformation. There are trials looking at MET inhibition as well as, um, uh, in, as, well as inhibition of, um, you, you know, use of BRAF inhibitors. However, caution is needed for IO combination as well, because there has been, there have been rates of pneumonitis that have been observed with uh, osimertinib and dervalumab, and as I pointed out, pembrolizumab was associated with an overall response rate of 0%. Um, what do we know about post-OC resistance? I will not spend a lot of time on this because I know the next talk is um, looking at this specifically, but we do know that there can be loss of T790M, and as there's loss of T790M, there may actually be worse survival for patients that lose T790M when treated with osimertinib in the post-T790M emergent setting. We're also learning very interesting things about the biology of um, post-OC resistance. These are uh, cases from uh, the recent publication in JAMA Oncology by Dr. Oxnard, where there was a patient with emergence of KRAS and another patient with emergence of MET amplification post osimertinib resistance. And then these are case reports from uh, the memorial group uh, with Dr. Yu, where ALK has been noted to be an emergent um, resistance mutation. Um, patients have been found to have ALK positivity. And then they have been treated with osimertinib and crizotinib, and osimertinib with electinib combination safely uh, with significant radiographic and clinical improvement. So again, truly personalized treatment for these patients. Um, RET translocations may also emerge post-OC resistance, and this is a case that was presented in Cancer Discovery uh, where this patient was treated with Blue 667, which is a novel RET inhibitor.
So in conclusion, um, osimertinib at this current time remains our standard approach for first-line therapy. Dacometinib appears promising, however, but may not be relevant in today's day and age, given the toxicity as well as the availability of osimertinib. We have to remember that significant percentage of our patients never make it to uh, second-line therapy, so we really should offer the safest, most effective approaches first. Emerging data suggests that combination with chemotherapy uh, may prolong PFS and overall survival. There's no clear benefit of using anti-angiogenesis upfront just yet. And I will point out that while there's a lot of interest in liquid biopsies, we must re-biopsy and get tissue at the time of progression as well, because the phenomenon of small cell transformation is real. And then role of IO is not clear at this time. In fact, immunotherapy monotherapy may lead to worse outcomes, so avoid using it despite the high prevalence of PDL one in this population. And with that, I will thank you for your attention.